hypothesis um, is a simple affirmative statement that might be right and it might be wrong. It should be able to be right and it should be able to be wrong. But it must be interesting and interesting means that nobody knows if it's right or it's wrong. And a good hypothesis is pure gold. It doesn't have to be right, it just has to be interesting. Hypothesis. Under time pressure, translators make more mistakes. Interesting? Are you interested in that? <laughs> sort of yeah, obvious. If it were wrong, it would be interesting, but I don't think it's going to be wrong. Um, under time pressure, <coughs> Translators improve the discursive quality of their text. The text reads better. Interesting? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, if we can go faster and get better, wait a minute. Could this be true? If so, why would it? Okay. Interesting. Hypothesis is a simple statement relating variables. What are variables? Things that vary. Back. Text quality here. Time pressure here. Two variables. I relate them. Okay? We'll come back to hypotheses. They've got to be, it's got to be simple language, okay? Then you have your method. How are you going to do it? Oh, I'm going to get uh, my translation practicum class. I'm going to make them translate a 250 word text in 20 minutes, and then I'm going to make them do it in 13 minutes. And then we're going to look at, then they're going to assess the quality of the translations by peer review, because I don't know Chinese. Peer review is a wonderful solution. And I bet that the faster translations, the time pressure translations, will have superior quality. But you have to think about some of the problems that are going to occur when we do this. For example, how am I going? Let's say, I, how am I going to do this? How am I going to create time pressure? But I want everybody to finish the translation. Why do I want people to finish the translation? Because if a translation is only half finished, how do I assess that? How do I assess a half completed translation with respect to a fully completed translation? How many? points do I give for completion? You know, it's just a mess. It's sort of arbitrary. So I have to have everybody finish the translation. How can I do that? Please help me. Just a very practical problem. Yes, sir? Well, you can do one where you get plenty of time, and then the second time you can do one where as soon as the last person finishes, you stop. As soon as the last person finishes. <laughs> I'll see, I'll, we're going to see some numbers in a minute, and you see how long the last person really takes. Yeah. Hmm. But I make them go as fast as possible. How do you do that? Crack a whip. Crack a whip. Good. Buy a whip. <laughs> uh, basically, that's, that's the only solution I can find. It's a very real problem. Um, now, one of the things we've been doing, if you're in that class, you'll know. First, I give you a 250 word text and just translate it. And you take as long as you need. And some guys finish, Daniel finishes 30% you know, faster than the rest of the class, but that's okay. That's normal, alright, for him. And, and others, I know people are different. I can take the average of that and say, for a 25 minute text, uh, 25, 250 word text, the average is, I don't know, 20 minutes. Now I'm going to reduce that by 30%, and there I've got my, I got my 13 minutes, 13 and a half minutes. We're going to do the same number of words in that 30%. I'll tell you why 30% in a minute. Yes, sir? Why, why wouldn't, like, if you're doing an actual study, why wouldn't you get a very large group of people, calculate the average, find the people in a large enough group that translate in a consistently, in consistent time under non-time pressure, 
and then establish a test for those people that would give them time constraint, but they would all finish it about the same time. All right, you'll see why in a minute. Okay. Uh, you know, I do it every year, so I've got 15 plus 15, and this year I have 16, so I'll have, what's that, 45. It's a fair sample. Uh, and from that later, I can, I can take the middle group out. I can say, you know, this guy's too fast, this guy's too slow, they're outliers, and I can deal with that middle group. Later on, it's, it's quite... The real problem is this. It has to do with the last thing there, the comparability of subjects. And it's a point that's been made with respect to all the research we're going to see. Um, some people are going to work faster because they're good at working faster. Okay? But I, you could do it you know, in 20 minutes and add 13 and a half and fine. And they're not going to suffer stress. That is, physically, they're not going to get adrenaline going down around their body. Okay, their pupils are not going to dilate. There are the physiological things that indicate stress. And the problem is, what are we measuring? The effects of stress or the effects of reducing time? Because you can reduce the time. Some people don't get any stress. Some people panic. Ah, I can't do it. Some people get really excited. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Completely re opposite reactions. First, presence of adrenaline and, and the psychological effects of adrenaline. And, and uh, one of the critiques of all this research said, well, look, you know, the only way to really do this is to create time pressure and then keep measuring blood, taking blood samples. I don't know what we're going to do in the class next week, do you? <laughs> and measuring the adrenaline in each blood sample after five minutes. And then we can really talk about it. Okay. Uh, this is when you get into things like the ecological validity of research. Um, if I got you next week and said I'm going to take blood samples from everybody every five minutes while you translate, but don't mind me, just keep translating. <laughs> You're not going to be too happy and your translating is not going to be you know, very natural, let's say. So there are some things you're just going to have to live with in the design for the sake of having a, an ecological... Well, what does that mean? It's, it's a bad jargon. For the sake of allowing people to translate in the way closest to what they possibly do, they normally do. Well, that would be ecological validity. Same thing, you, you know I've shown you eye tracking that, that we use. Some of the eye tracking instruments, the ones the uh, psychologists use for reading, for studying reading, very, very exact. They've got all this stuff that fits over your head, you know, so that you can. And it's looking at your eyes right there. It looks like a, I don't know, spaceship kind of alien type being. You know, uh, and that's good for them, but for translators, it's not good. So we tend to use uh, one that just goes around the screen here. It's absolutely not obtrusive. You can work on your computer screen, it's tracking your eyes and you don't know it, or you forget about it. Okay, it's not as exact, but it's ecologically valid. It allows the translation process to proceed. For the same reason, I might add, if we're studying time pressure, we wouldn't use the think aloud technique. You know, I talked about think aloud protocols. As you translate, you say what you're doing. Well, comparative studies have shown that when people are speaking, they translate about 15% slower. So the, the research methodology is going to influence the one variable we, we want to test, so we can't, we can't use that methodology. Okay? So these are all things to take into account when you're doing um, the research design. A basic problem is this. Are you going to have one translator do different texts or many translators do the one text? Do you see what I mean? I mean, I've got different people with different languages. And I'm going to have to get them to do two translations, one's faster than the other. How am I going to do it? 
And every solution has a good side and a bad side. Let's think about it. I get one text divided into two. And I give you the first half now, you go slow, and I give you the second half half an hour later, and you make you, I make you go fast. Good research design? Or not? What's wrong? The text, it was the one text, I just cut it in half. Right, but I mean, you are really being strict about it. You would be doing the same exact text. Translate the same text? I mean, but that doesn't make sense. You can't do that. Yes, what well, I can, yes. Yes, it's very interesting. That's a, we saw that with Daniel Gilles' experiment, when he made interpreters interpret the same text and got some very interesting results. So I could make you work on the same text. What would be wrong with that? But then you're not necessarily knowing the content would change the outcome. Yeah, sure. I mean, in both cases, in both of those methodologies, you've got a learning effect. Yeah. You know, the, the experience of having done the first part of the experiment will affect what you do in the second. So, of course, you're going to go faster, whether or not there's time pressure. So that's not really a methodology we want to use here. The alternative is... I can get um, different texts, okay, on, on the same topic but different texts. Uh, so I minimize the learning effect. What's wrong with that? I don't know if the two texts are of the same degree of difficulty. And it's very hard to take, you know, we can do it. You can spend a lot of time drawing up difficulty parameters. And then the other problem is that a text that's difficult for one person is not difficult for the next one. So, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, this is a real problem. So text selection is a major drawback of these methodologies. The other thing you can do is if you've got 100 people, you know, 50, half of you translate it in 20 minutes, and the other half of you uh, make you go in, in 30 minutes. All right? And then I'm comparing the groups. So there's no learning effect at all. But how do I know this half is the same as that half? If I've got 100, I can, I can bet it's okay. Uh, but if I'm restricted to 15, you know, 7 and a half, 7 and a half, look, well, you reverse the order. You, you think, is there a learning effect? Is, or is there an order effect? Most experiments have an order of activities. Is that influencing the result? Half the group does A, B, and the other half does B, A. The more you build in these safeguards, the bigger the number of people you need, and the more difficult it is. Okay, so often, in, in my case with the class there, I have to start, I've got 16 students, what can I do with 16 subjects? I can't make it very complicated, because I'm going to get down to just two subjects per variable combination, not going to work. If I've got 500, hey, I could do tons of stuff, but it takes me 10 years to analyze the data. <laughs> Should we do the fast one first, or the slow one first? And does it matter? I don't know. All the experiments have done the slow and then the fast. But we don't know what happens if you go the other way. Hopefully, we would test it by reversing the order and find no significant difference. If we do find some significant difference, then we're in trouble, we have to explain why. Here's an example of a very simple test that you can do. <laughs> Topic, hmm, research question. I wonder, if you drink wine while you're translating, what happens? Okay, hypothesis, the more wine the subject consumes, the more creative the translation becomes. <laughs> Interesting, yes, I think. Five willing final year master's students who drink wine. We have a problem. Some people drink a lot of wine and it has no effect, and some people drink half a glass and they're screaming. So we might have to do some testing prior to the experiment to see who handles the wine and how to <laughs> You're welcome to do this. So. Method. Subjects translate the first chapter of Cannery Row into their L1, 
your main language. Consuming one glass of Yellowtail Cabernet Sauvignon 2011. We're not spending a lot of money on this experiment. <laughs> per five minutes of translation time. So some of you are going to have to work, you know. It's like this may be may get in the way of the typing process, so we could do one of these tube things better. <laughs> The translation is saved after each five minute period. This so so you can't go when you can't go back and mess up when you're really drunk. Otherwise you could go back and revise the beginning and, and so we have to save it as you go along. And we do that for 20 minutes. So we get four translations or translation fragments and we compare them for creative shifts. Good methodology. Pretty simple one, I think. Expected results. The last translations will have significantly more creative shifts than the first translation. And then the last translations will have significantly more typos than the first translation. So you're going to be more creative, but make, make more mistakes. Well, or not. Who knows? It could be like time pressure. Some people get better with time pressure. Some people get better with wine for a while. Expected benefits, translators will be more creative, happier, and should know when to stop drinking. This piece of knowledge will be socially useful. Okay. And you have to justify, seriously, you have to justify research. It's got to be a benefit to someone. Uh, because you're using resources, probably money, at least your time and your subjects to do the research. Good. That's an example of basic research design. It could be one page, okay, but it has to hold together. I think it's an interesting thing. Why is it? Who is it going to benefit to start with? People who employ translators are very interested because they're going to make more money. If you go faster, productivity raised is higher, and so more money for your employers. The people who uh, make the tools have more productivity. Translators are going to have more nervous breakdowns and not get any money from it. Or they can realize that they can go faster and make sure they get the rewards of their productivity. Okay? And researchers are going to have some juicy new problems. I have had, when doing this research seriously, not what we do in class is just fun in class, but um, I've had people, translators, object and say they don't want to participate in the experiment, even when we pay them to come and do the experiment, because they say um, this will simply um, result in translators being paid less money. Uh, they, they, they take an ethical stance to say all this research, all this technology is raising the productivity of translators, but we can see the more our productivity is raised, uh, at least in Europe and, and South America, the price you'll pay per word is declining. And so, so I've had some people just refuse to take part in any experiment that's going to go along that way. And my argument as a researcher will say, look, I'm just giving you the knowledge. You use that knowledge to go out and renegotiate with your clients. But you're better off having that knowledge than not. What happens under time pressure? Well, let's think. Could be more errors. Could be less communicative quality. The text is going to lack something, perhaps. You're going to get more money. Somebody should get more money. If you're doing the same thing in less time, somebody's going to get some economic rewards. Are you going to get more or less job satisfaction? Interesting question. Probably less. But we don't know. And is everybody going to handle this the same way? And as you'll see in a minute, that's the key question. Some people handle it in some ways, and others in other ways. So these are the sort of issues we're going to have to think about around the question of benefits of our knowledge. It's not easy. <laughs>